Now, as I've mentioned, Russia's position in Europe and the, uh, the gas sector has weakened because of all of these uh, shifts with Europe's demand shrinking, the economic crisis. Um, and also, um, Russia has seen China actively expand its footprint in Central Asia, the area where Russia thought it really had the uh, upper hand in the um, uh, 2000s. Uh, China has really moved very actively and aggressively over the last uh, three or four years to become one of the major players in, uh, in the gas sector. And China itself is much less interested in importing gas from Russia, as it seemed to be uh, about five years ago. And really, Russia is finding itself with fewer options for really expanding its gas exports other than Europe. And so it's really trying to figure out here now how can it deal more directly uh, with European countries. So over the last couple of years, we've seen Russia moving quite aggressively to try to build alternative power, uh, sorry, pipeline um, uh, projects um, to build pipelines directly to the main consumers in Europe, uh, avoiding Poland and Ukraine and other transit countries, building gas pipelines across the uh, Black Sea, um, including the Blue Stream pipeline to Turkey, and also thinking of other pipelines, all of which are competing with gas from places like Azerbaijan, moving from the Caspian across uh, the Caucasus to Europe. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention here, it's not just oil and gas, and this is something to bear in mind when we think about the uh, Caucasus, because we've also seen Russia looking across the whole of the energy spectrum and trying to think about how it can enhance its, um, uh, its uh, advantage. I mentioned the nuclear industry. There's been a huge push, which Japan will have set back, unfortunately for Russia, to expand Russia's nuclear uh, power sector. Russia was hoping, in fact, to build seven new reactors in Turkey. Um, they still say they're going to press ahead after a recent uh, visit <coughs> between Erdogan and Putin, but there's a big question mark as to whether that's going to be the case. But what we've also seen is Russian companies over the last several years have acquired a whole host of other assets related to energy, refineries, storage facilities, ports uh, for the export of um, oil and gas, and they've also expanded into regional electricity markets. And this has really taken advantage of uh, the um, abundance of raw materials for power generation in Russia and also the extensive Soviet era network of power plants, electricity, transmission lines. And this is where the Caucasus has become a linchpin of this. Because Russia now has uh, really considerable ambitions to export electricity more broadly, including uh, to Europe, so not just oil and gas. And Interrao UES, which is uh, the largest electricity company in Russia, has become extremely prominent in Armenia and elsewhere across the Caucasus. Now, Interrao UES is the successor company to the electricity monopoly UES, which in 2003 went through a major overhaul under Anatoly Chubais, who many of you might remember uh, from his past lives in the 1990s when he was one of the pioneering reformers under um, President Yeltsin. Well, in 2003, Chubais was um, told to basically reform uh, UES and to split up the electricity monopoly into all of its different power generation and electricity um, transmission. And now what we have found when uh, you look at UES, and uh, I, I mean, again, you're probably wondering why am I dwelling on this so much, but UES has now become a conglomeration of about 20 companies, most of them based in all the former Soviet uh, republics, and uh, uh, is really poising itself now uh, to try to export electricity um, from Europe, to Europe from the South Caucasus into, uh, and also more broadly from Central Asia um, into adjacent countries. And the um, express goal of Rao UES, again uh, from uh, their published documents, is to fuel the growth of the Russian Federation's economy. And in the fall of 2008, there was a notable shift in uh, the leadership of Rao UES. And the Russian Deputy Prime Minister, who's in charge of all of the Russian energy sector, Igor Sechin, was named chairman of the board of the company. And this is what I said at the very beginning, a very small group of people who were in charge of all of the economic assets, many of whom have official government positions. And um, uh, the mission statement for the company was changed all in the same time frame that Sechin was put in charge. And it's now very explicitly geared uh, towards fulfilling the goals of uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, only number five in their list of strategic goals is a commercial goal of um, enhancing uh, shareholder value. All of the other goals are about increasing Russia's foreign presence in, um, presence rather in foreign markets and uh, creating conditions for the energy security of the Russian Federation. And if you look at the uh, case of Armenia, for example, on the chart, which is very uh, nicely laid out of UES, of all the thing, assets that they own, there are some surprises. The Armenian nuclear power plant, for example, which produces about 50% of all of uh, Armenia's electrical power, the famous uh, nuclear power plant that all of you are very familiar with, 100% of that is owned by Rao UES. 
Armenia's International Energy Corporation, which produces about 12% of all of uh, Armenia's energy, 90% owned by Rao UES. And the entire Armenian electrical grid is owned by Rao UES. And it's actually almost the same for Georgia. In spite of the war in 2008, the bulk of, uh, of Georgia's um, electricity uh, distribution network, how much of its power generation is still owned, um, or is now owned by Russia. Same in Kazakhstan, Moldova, Tajikistan, and many other countries. So what's the point of all this? Well, this has been a real shift over the last uh, several uh, decades. And um, uh, Igor Chubayas, back in 2003, when he was appointed uh, to the head of uh, Rao UES, um, had a very interesting press conference um, at the end of Russia. Ron and a couple of other people in the audience might remember this. It was actually a very famous uh, press conference because Chubayas, who was known as being really the um, leading liberal reformer in the 1990s, said that Russia's goal um, from the, here on forth was going to be cr to create a liberal empire. And by this he said that um, the um, future way that Russia would reassert its uh, political power and influence, and he specifically singled out the Caucasus and Central Asia, would be by drawing on its economic clout, rather than on resorting to the deployment of military hard power as it had in the past. Well, maybe he didn't prefigure the war in uh, Georgia in 2008. But the main point that he was making was that electricity, Gazprom and gas, uh, Russian oil rather than the Russian Red Army were now going to be the penetrating forces of uh, Russian influence in the, in the neighborhood. And this is actually um, somewhat strange for um, historians thinking back to the history of the Soviet Union. Uh, some of you who have uh, studied um, uh, Russian and Soviet history might remember that in the 1920s Vladimir Lenin said that communism was Soviet power plus the electrification of the whole country. So I guess Chubais's liberal um, empire was really the electrification uh, of the whole of uh, Eurasia under Rao UES. So in any case, now Anatoly Chubais is in, is in charge of the Russian nanotechnology um, corporation. He's no longer the head of UES, as I said. Uh, Igor Sechin is now chairman of the board. So I guess there are whole uh, new areas of micro-influence that uh, the Russian uh, government can expand into. In any case, we're certainly in just in a different arena now of, uh, of Russian influence, and when we start thinking about the future role of Russia in the Caucasus and elsewhere, it's going to be in different forms uh, than we'd really uh, talked about it for most of the 1990s and beyond when we were much more focused on conflicts and other issues. Now, another element that I want to um, <clears throat> point to here before getting um, a little bit um, to uh, the issue of um, Russia and the United States and the Caucasus uh, to wrap up here is that the demographic changes in Russia that there's been a great deal of attention paid to over the last uh, decade also have some serious implications for the Caucasus, but again in ways that we may not have uh, thought about. Most of you are well aware that the Russian population has been uh, undergoing what some have described a catastrophic uh, decline. Russia's population is about 140, 142 million now, and since 1993 it's been um, undergoing a, really a dramatic uh, shrinking. Now, in actual fact, this decline tapered off in around 2007, and there was a small increase in population in 2009, but this hasn't really done very much uh, to change uh, the longer-term trajectory. And as of this year, uh, the Russian labor force begins to decline by a million a year. That's just simply the fact of the long-term um, effects of uh, this decline in the population and lower fertility rates in Russia. Now, for Russia, this is something of a quandary. In the past, when we think back to those mass modernizations, of, particularly of Stalin, it was always done through the mobilization of manpower in Russia on a vast scale, be it collectivization, the gulag, <clears throat> creating the world's largest military um, in terms of manpower and a conventional force. And perhaps Russia doesn't need that kind of scale of manpower as it did in the past. If you think about the oil and gas sectors, which I've just described as being the linchpin to Russia's future, only about 1 or 2% of the population, or rather the workforce, are employed in that in the other commodity sector. But you do need a healthy and uh, qualified, well-educated population if you're going to have a modern economy. And Russia has <clears throat> certainly um, realized that it can't maintain the military that it used to uh, maintain before, and is now in the process of a radical reform of the military, which has put more attention back onto its uh, nuclear strategic um, uh, uh, stockpile and uh, onto the strategic forces, getting us back again to uh, the security focus with the United States. But the main change that we've seen as a result of the demography is how it has shifted the population in Russia. And what we're going to see in this decade is a Russia that we haven't really seen before, because the demographic decline has not been even across the country. 
You've seen a vast decrease in population even in the northwest of Russia around St. Petersburg. I mean, the Ural Siberia is uh, fairly obvious. But you've seen a huge increase in population in two places. One is in Moscow, which may seem obvious, but the other is southern Russia, where the North Caucasus is, the most sensitive part of the Russian Federation with an active insurgency. And this means that the Russia that we're going to see in this decade is a Russia that's concentrated in Moscow and then in the south around the Black Sea, uh, around um, the area where uh, they have the greatest uh, neuralgia, close, of course, to the borders with uh, Georgia, Armenia, and with Azerbaijan. And so a Russia that's really going to be focused on the problems that it faces in this very volatile uh, region at a time when it was wanting to showcase its rise with the 2014 uh, Sochi Olympics. So the crowded Caucasus for Russia is going to be one of the, the most uh, difficult places for it um, as it thinks into this next, um, uh, next decade. And really with the uh, presidential election uh, looming very shortly against the backdrop of increasing terrorist attacks uh, in Moscow and elsewhere across the region could in fact play um, a very negative role in uh, the election um, as this uh, proceeds. So this uh, takes us onto a, you know, a very, uh, a very different uh, place um, as we think about um, uh, the decade ahead, and where will the United States uh, uh, go in its policy towards uh, Russia? Now I just want to review um, just very quickly here um, because I don't want to um, take up uh, all of the time and leave uh, some time for us to have a bit of a discussion. If we think about over the last two decades of U.S. policy in the Caucasus, unfortunately it's tended to reinforce rather than change. Russia's single-minded focus on energy um, in the region. If we think back to the 1990s, the time when Jira was uh, most active in uh, Armenia, all of the focus of the United States was on uh, trying to promote energy independence. Of course, Armenia was uh, somewhat lost in the, this larger policy, but the focus was on trying to create alternative export routes for Caspian Basin energy development uh, to world markets to break Russia's monopoly um, on the region. There were occasional designs for creating conflict resolution through pipelines. Jack Moreska, the um, U.S. ambassador of the U.S.C. in the Minsk Group, had the idea of a pipeline for peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But one way or another, the U.S. was also fixated on um, energy and oil. And for most of the 1990s and into the early 2000s, the focal point was the creation of the baku tbilisi chehan BTC oil pipeline uh, from the Caspian and Azerbaijan uh, to Turkey. In the 2000s, this whole policy began to run out of steam. The baku tbilisi chehan pipeline came into being in between 2002 and 2005, and the focus shifted to gas. Uh, for gas, it was very difficult for the United States to try to push the kind of projects it had done in oil in the 1990s. Gas um, isn't the same fungible global product that oil is. The United States didn't have the market clearly for Caspian gas. This was all really focused on Europe, and the United States really couldn't push uh, this policy along. And so um, the United States uh, policy by the 2000s, um, the mid-2000s, started to shift again to an area where the United States uh, wasn't uh, perhaps in charge of the whole um, uh, long-term agenda and started to focus on the, getting the um, European Union more involved in the region and in fact trying to encourage the EU to expand uh, more quickly uh, to the countries of the Caucasus. Uh, that was also obviously pretty difficult. Uh, the EU uh, was not enthusiastic about this uh, venture at all. And by 2006, when uh, Russia was really back in business in terms of a major player um, in the region and after the cutoff uh, of gas uh, to Ukraine, the US started to focus uh, more um, uh, in more detail then on Euro-Atlantic uh, structures and on trying to um, push forward the further enlargement of NATO. After bringing in uh, Eastern European and the Baltic states, uh, there was a hope that um, if uh, a push was made for Georgia and Ukraine in particular, as kind of swing, swing states for a broader region, that that might have a transformative effect on the rest of the Caucasus and the rest of the uh, former uh, Soviet uh, republics. So from 2006 to 2008, really until the war in Georgia, we saw a U.S. Um, policy focused very much on trying to transform uh, the region uh, by outreach uh, through NATO, which really founded um, <clears throat> with, the, uh, with the war in uh, Georgia in 2008. And now um, we're looking at a situation where the U.S. is looking for a new policy in, uh, in the Caucasus, and one that can match uh, the reset uh, with Russia. 
at the very beginning of uh, the Obama administration, uh, pretty much at the same time uh, that the reset was launched, as you are all aware, there was a real push to try to do something else transformative in the Caucasus and to try to foster reconciliation between uh, Turkey and Armenia. Now, unfortunately, um, although this was seen as a, a potential regional game changer, the same way that it would have been if Georgia or Ukraine had had a membership action plan for NATO, realities in the region, a range of domestic and other um, international pressures, and the furious reaction of Azerbaijan sidelined that effort, and pretty much everyone accepts now that that's stalled. So where we are right now in 2011 is that the US is in search of a policy uh, for the Caucasus and is also trying to figure out what Russia's long-term intentions are. And I, I've, I've skipped through you know, what I heard in a lot more detail about American policies. We can talk about that a bit more if you want to in the Q&A. But the US has really come to the realization that it doesn't really have much of a policy in the Caucasus. There are no new pipelines to build, like Baku, Tbilisi, Chehan. There's the Nabucco gas pipeline, but that's really not as inspiring as uh, the BTC pipeline was. There's no EU or NATO membership on the table for the Caucasus or any other of uh, the regional countries. The regional co uh, conflicts that Gerard and others have worked so hard uh, to try to resolve in the last um, two decades have been bogged down in process and resolution seems uh, pretty remote. And as I said, Russia's long-term intentions seem uh, somewhat um, unpredictable beyond their clear desire to really expand their economic influence uh, very aggressively in the region. And in the wake of the financial crisis and the, um, and the recession, the United States government clearly doesn't have the cash that it had in the 1990s when it was able to really launch some of these more ambitious uh, projects uh, for the region. The US also has rather limited attention now to um, give to the Caucasus and even to Russia, to be honest, given everything else on its global agenda. The same um, multilateral approach uh, to the region that there was when there was an idea of binding it all together uh, with energy uh, programs and projects. And the emphasis now is on the bilateral relationships, which are always very difficult uh, to manage in isolation. Issues like Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, and now the upheavals in the Middle East have pulled not just US government attention away, but also a lot of the analytical and uh, policy expertise. Um, during uh, the Bush administration, uh, there were lots of seasoned um, uh, policymakers at the State Department and elsewhere who had a lot of expertise in Eastern Europe and in the Caucasus who set priorities and really shaped an agenda. Many of them have just gone off entirely to other places in this last, uh, in this last decade. And with so much in its plate, the US doesn't really have the political surge capacity to deal with the crisis. After making a, a, a really um, valiant push for Turkey-Armenian reconciliation, it's really lost steam. And as we saw with the crisis in Kyrgyzstan last summer, it's very difficult for the US to muster the resources to really address the kinds of problems that are going to arise there. The latest US idea is that the EU might be able to step up again uh, to deal uh, with its neighborhood. The EU set up um, a partnership program, the um, Eastern Partnership Program in 2008-2009 that includes the Caucasus. But frankly, the European Union, I'm now the director of the Centre on the US and Europe, so unfortunately I know this only too well, um, also doesn't have the financial wherewithal or the personnel to really craft an effective uh, policy in the Caucasus or more broadly. And the EU is now getting pushed, especially now that um, Britain and France are taking the lead in Libya, uh, with the uh, military intervention there, to come up with an entirely new policy to the other parts of its neighborhood in the Mediterranean. So we're really seeing here now a shift of focus entirely away from the region that we've all spent so much time uh, looking at, and a big question about whether we'll have the wherewithal uh, to be able to craft a new um, policy there. There do seem to be that there should be opportunities. Um, the European Union is now faced with a, an, en an energy security crisis because the alternatives uh, to Russian energy uh, in North Africa have been cut off. Libya was a major export of oil and gas, especially to Italy, but more broadly uh, to Europe, which has raised a lot of questions about the future of European energy security. There are also even bigger questions, of course, uh, about the future of Saudi Arabia and other of the Gulf uh, states that uh, were worrying not just to Europe, but more broadly. One would think that that would put the spotlight on Caspian energy again, and uh, perhaps some of the projects that the United States tried to champion earlier. But it's more likely, of course, to put the spotlight back on Russia, given the fact that Russia still dominates all of uh, the infrastructure. So uh, we have an awful lot of challenges here. Uh, as I said, I could go on, but fortunately my voice is telling me <clears throat> that I need to stop uh, to turn over uh, to you a little more. 
But the fact that the um, United States has run out of steam and run out of ideas for the region gives a lot of um, openings for us here in the Academy, Michigan, the Armenian Studies Program, and more broadly, to come up with ideas. So I'm hoping uh, that in the course of uh, the discussion now uh, we might have some, and then I can report back to um, DC and say, we've, we've, got, we've got the solution. Um, of course, that might not be a very practical. I'm off to Brussels later in the week as well, so any ideas that we can have for our colleagues in the EU, I know, would also be uh, very gratefully accepted. But anyway, thank you for your patience for listening. Sorry about the uh, scratchy voice that I've developed. And uh, again, it's just a real honor to be here. And I know I've covered a lot of territory here, um, but... Um, this is such a well-informed audience. I'm really looking forward to hear some of your observations and thoughts on these topics as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for a very, very interesting talk. I have three observations, or one sort of one question and two observations. The question deals with uh, the very intriguing uh, 20. Uh, uh, Russian elites. Uh, I mean, you did uh, mention that they were uh, embedded in both political and economic contexts. But I just uh, want to know how transferable their power is from one context to the other, because that probably says a lot. And where are they specially located? Are they located all in, sort of in Russia, or do they have also some uh, connections in, in some of the other republics? Uh, because that also, it's not only the network, it's also the, the breadth and sort of the extent of the network that would be important. So I, that I don't know about, so I'm totally ignorant. With respect to the other, uh, I am surprised that uh, when uh, you are discussing uh, these contexts, uh, you are using the nation state formation as the, the sort of the boundedness uh, of these uh, uh, countries. So in a way, you know, Russia is sort of independent of the EU, is independent of the US, and I think uh, if anything is going to happen, and this is the third one, uh, it will happen as uh, people uh, in one context or another start collaborating with each other across these divides. Uh, and that is probably why, I mean, uh, the analysis, of course, when you focus on the economy and such uh, and politics becomes state driven. But it is not obviously civil society driven to the same degree. And if we presume change is going to come from civil society, then it would be very interesting to look at, uh, for example, interactions between diasporic populations with their countries of origin or uh, of different countries with each other through the civil uh, societal uh, organizations. So I wondered what you thought about that. Sorry for that. No, that's a great point. Um, in fact, I um, often give a completely different presentation from this one that touches in particular on that last point uh, that you're making because actually I agree with you entirely. I think that Russia is really changing and part of this changing social dynamics I was talking about also involves the formation of diasporas and other interconnections. One of the um, issues that's um, really um, played into these demographic shifts in Russia has been the brain drain from Russia. You've got multiple Russias that have developed now. I mean, as I'm sure you're more than well aware I mean, part of the best illustration of this was the Nobel Prize for Physics um, this past year, where the two physicists were Russian, but they were working at the University of Manchester. And I think one of them was still a Russian citizen. One, I think, had got British or Dutch or some uh, citizenship. But in any case, I mean, they were both Russians. And this is a, a phenomenon that the Russian government has really been um, uh, grappling with. Because, I mean, I th and I think that tension showed in my um, presentation here, there's a tension between, as you say, the state-based formation and the fact that in actual fact this state-based formation is run by non-state actors in many respects, these networks, these personal networks that have been formed by the group of people at the top. And just as you were pointing out, I mean, in the, in the question, I mean, they really are extended much more beyond Russia itself. And what we're really seeing is the a formation of a Russian elite even at the top that have multiple uh, different vantage points. Some Russian officials you know, admit quite openly, uh, although behind uh, closed doors and off-the-record discussions, that they own multiple properties outside of Russia. 
in uh, one very prominent uh, senior Russian uh, let slip uh, in a uh, kind of a give and take uh, while I was at a conference that he has a flat in London and spends most of his time there, which was um, something surprising. Uh, but again, indicative of the point that we're making, that because many of the Russian elite themselves feel more comfortable being outside of Russia. They have their children educated outside Russia. They have second homes, maybe even first homes outside Russia. They have a lot of assets outside. And what you're asking about this sort of interconnectedness, I mean, there's a lot of evidence and a lot of research that's showing that people at the top inside of Russia have acquired assets, uh, particularly these economic political elites that are fused together um, in other countries. There are trading networks that are extended outside. Um, in Armenia itself, I mean, there's talk about the oligarchs, and many of those oligarchs are Armenians who um, have built up their fortunes in Russia. But there are also Russians who are investing heavily in places like Armenia and elsewhere. So this is a very complicated uh, process here. And uh, the Russian government itself is grappling with this for the future of uh, the Russian Federation. As I say, it, what you're seeing is the development not of one Russia that's going to move forward, but multiple hybrid Russias of Russians who are still Russian. They're Russian citizens, but they're living and operating more in Europe than they are in anywhere else. And your point about US and EU and Russia all acting independently, that's obviously not the case anymore. Um, if you look at um, any U major European city, London, for example, the last time I was in London, I sat in Green Park, um, you know, just uh, near Buckingham Palace, and every single person who walked past me for about a 10 minute period was speaking in Russian. Uh, because this is the area where, in Mayfair, where all the Russians have their houses, and every shop now has signs in Russian, especially the luxury yacht division that's just near the Ritz. Um, anyway, if you want to go yacht shopping, you can window shop uh, for a major yacht uh, just uh, opposite the Ritz in London, just you know, very handy if you're in the business for getting a yacht. But this really brings home um, that the Russians are already outside and, uh, and living outside and interacting. And in fact, I believe now that the greatest threat from Russia, even though in their military doctrine, in this the expansion of NATO would be the collapse of the Eurozone and a deeper re um, recession in uh, Europe that would in fact start to um, affect uh, both their business and economic interests. So this is a real complex uh, situation that's developing now. A lot of Russian sociologists are looking at this, these formations of uh, the new elites, this new dynamic. It's extremely um, difficult, in fact, to predict uh, where it may, uh, it may go in the future because it does uh, raise a lot of questions where Russia can really um, even um, continue autonomously. There's always this streak in uh, Russian history and also in Russian politics towards autarky, of self-sufficiency of being cut off. There's now a big debate in Russia um, about uh, the future uh, direction of the country should it make a choice between east or west, the rising China, the dynamism of the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, there's a famous uh, recent article by Vyacheslav Nikonov, uh, for those history buffs, uh, Molotov's uh, grandson, who's talking about Russia becoming a Euro-Pacific power, somehow skipping over Eurasia and the whole Siberia, and being rooted in Europe and in the Asia-Pacific uh, simultaneously. And others who are arguing completely the country, forget the Asia-Pacific, we can never really have any traction there. Our future with Europe because that's of course where everybody seems to be living and, and working and uh, you know essentially moving uh, one way or another. So we're really seeing again one of these big historical moments um, in Russia where the whole future of the country is being argued out and where in many respect the elites are reflecting um, uh, at the very top level uh, all of this uh, new dynamic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a really terrific talk. That was a tour de force going through all that. Um, the U.S. now, uh, given these revolutions and movements in the Arab world, has been caught between its democratic rhetoric and, and sort of values and the questions of security. Does Russia face a similar problem? It doesn't obviously have the same kind of democratic values. But here it is in an unstable area, the former Soviet Union. There are regimes which it hasn't been that happy with. Some of them may soon have movements. That is, Armenia, there are thousands of people on the street uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, so the regimes might change in different ways. How would Russia feel about this? How would, not that they'll intervene, not that they'll bomb or whatever, but how would they react, do you think, if something happens in Armenia? if uh, Saakashvili is weakened in Georgia, if there's change again in Kyrgyzstan, I'd like to hear about that. 
Yeah, this is a good a great question because actually Russia really is caught. Um, um, you know, as I've said in the talk, uh, the, the real focal point of its uh, foreign policy is to retain influence here. And, and mostly that's been uh, through economic uh, means, through all the kinds of means of influence I just described, with, of course, the very notable exception of still resorting to hard force uh, against Saakashvili and Georgia in 2008 and continuing to do a bit of military muscle flexing and intimidation there. But what the Russians have also done is play with their media. And you mentioned uh, Kyrgyzstan, and I think uh, Doug Northrup is uh, in the audience here who works on Central Asia. And uh, one of uh, the um, instigating factors uh, uh, behind the last set of um, upheavals in Kyrgyzstan was the role of the Russian media. Um, Bakiev, um, the last uh, Kyrgyz uh, president, was very unpopular in Moscow because he was also trying to play his own games and basically playing off the United States and Russia um, against each other of the issue of the Manasseh base, among many other things, uh, for, you know, which is a, a key transit uh, base in the United States for Afghanistan. And there was a whole series of um, uh, programs in the Russian press uh, basically asking a lot of questions in the TV, that is, uh, about Bakiev and spotlighting uh, the corruption in the Bakiev family. And that actually played a role um, in uh, the upheavals in Kyrgyzstan because the Kyrgyz uh, uh, population was watching a lot of Russian TV. There's not a great deal of you know, Kyrgyz TV going. What's notable is the new Kyrgyz government is uh, trying to change the frequency for the Russian television uh, to try to limit this. Uh, they, they, they cottoned onto this uh, pretty quickly. Now, the Russians got more than they bargained for in Kyrgyzstan because although they wanted to perhaps weaken Bakir further and perhaps wrest some concessions out of him, I'm not entirely sure that they calculated that this would lead to his imminent demise and that it would, in fact, spur off the horrible violence that we saw in Osh uh, last summer. And then, of course, you remember that the Kyrgyz um, provisional government asked uh, Russia to intervene and they you know, quickly stepped back uh, from, uh, from uh, that one. Same in Belarus uh, with Lukashenko. Um, and in the run-up uh, to the elections in December, uh, the Russian TV started showing a lot of programs about the corruption in, uh, in Belarus and Lukashenko who they've never really liked. But then they seemed to step back from uh, perhaps you know, wanting him to uh, take a fall in the elections, uh, opening up uh, the possibility for Lukashenko to be able to uh, you know, basically beat back his own demonstrations and protests. The latest is Kazakhstan, which has elections on uh, April 3rd. Uh, the Kazakhs have uh, remarkable bad timing in choosing to have snap presidential elections. They called these after the OSCE summit in Astana, which they hosted, which was sort of a high point of uh, their diplomacy and foreign policy. And oops, next thing, they have a revolt in Tunisia and uh, Egypt, uh, raising questions about um, you know, the longevity of uh, presidents in uh, countries. And Nazarbayev was hoping for yet another uh, presidential term. Now the Kazakhs are very nervous. And all of a sudden, there are programs on Russian TV raising questions about the Nazarbayev family and corruption in the family. Now, the speculation in Kazakhstan is, again, there's more interest in um, getting some concessions here. There's a lot of interest from Russian energy companies, the Russian railroads, about asset acquisition and privatizations, and they're feeling that China's been getting too much of an, um, uh, let's see, a sort of an uh, advantageous position in the Kazakh economy. So the speculation among the pundits in Kazakhstan is that this is Russian sending a signal. But this is a real dilemma because as we learned in Kyrgyzstan, you can overdo it or you can have unintended consequences. So the Russians are caught by, by wanting to play the old game of divide and rule or manipulate, uh, try to get some uh, little bit of influence here to remind uh, the neighboring countries and neighboring leaders that uh, they are the dominant um, uh, uh, power still uh, in the neighborhood. But in this uh, day and age, and against the backdrop of what has happened in the Middle East, it's very difficult to play those games. And they can also um, have blowback. So, um, you know, just as the Russians are, are, are um, trying to manipulate and influence, and it's not exactly clear, you know, to what purposes, they're also incredibly paranoid now, judging by the press and all of uh, the reports and the various blogs and the things about someone else doing that to them. Um, as many of you will be aware if you've um, watched uh, Russia Today, um, my favorite channel, mm -hmm. and uh, also um, looked at um, some of the other um, Russian government websites and indeed speeches from people like Igor Sechin and others. He had an interview not long ago in the Wall Street Journal. They think we've done everything in the Middle East, the United States. Uh, if only we could be uh, you know, so sophisticated and organized. As we all know, unfortunately, the United States is also playing catch up with events in the Middle East. But the Russian government is convinced that for some purposes and uh, uh, that we have not 
quite fully divined yet, the United States orchestrated all of this, and that, that there's a real risk that we might start doing the same in the uh, 2012 elections. So this is a really delicate uh, period where it does raise an awful lot of questions about the old means of influence, of using the media, of trying to um, exert uh, uh, political pressure on your neighbours to wrest concessions for foreign policy or economic uh, policy goals, and how this, in fact, uh, could uh, really blow back. I mean, the United States knows this only too well, uh, the risk of unintended, uh, unintended consequences. So it'll be very interesting to see how the Russians uh, continue to react on this as things unfold in Libya uh, and elsewhere. And it's going to be a real challenge also for the United States in the relationship with Russia of trying to dissuade the Russians from you know, this kind of uh, conduct, but also reassure the Russians that we're not trying uh, to do it to them as well. So this is, again, a very difficult, difficult and uh, delicate period that we're in. Just a few things from the personal experience. Uh, Libya is very important. I was an interpreter with Libyan students for quite a while. Uh, and I know three or four generations of uh, young Russian men went to Libya to make careers in the military because it was a major consumer of Russian armaments, of Soviet armaments. Uh, then uh, managers, uh, Russians were thick on the ground before the events started. It's really amazing that Russia voted, uh, or rather abstained. So it means, I think, a very serious concession, because there's a lot of pressure, including Primakov and people, on uh, taking, uh, <coughs> siding with uh, Qaddafi. Uh, and uh, also, this uh, unusual Russian stance resulted in the uh, split within the, between, Yel uh, between um, sorry, Medvedev and uh, Putin. Putin described the, Amer the American and Western attacks, attacks on Libya as a crusade, and then he was disavowed by uh, Medvedev actually publicly, indicating that Russia doesn't know exactly what, how to deal with this crisis. Uh, which is very unusual. Yesterday, uh, the day before, the Vienach, the, the Russian main program, gives um, basically a positive view of the rebels. Yesterday, I watched it. It's a complete reversal. Uh, now, the, uh, these are uh, villains, uh, and uh, Gaddafi is uh, basically defending the sovereignty of his country. So, and these shifts are, I find, as a Soviet citizen, Russian citizen, very unusual because, and I don't know what to make of them. And the second point is that um, this, um, I, I, I spent one month in Russia, and I, uh, what you mentioned is indeed, uh, that's where the population grows, uh, that's where people are much happier than in the capitals, um, and that's where we see a very successful uh, model of coexistence of various ethnic groups in the Kuban region, for instance. The Greeks, the Armenians, the Georgians, uh, the Adigs, Circassians, and the Russians live in a relative harmony. Uh, when you go up north, you know, uh, you see this ethnic tensions when uh, people from the Caucasus are being, are being arrested, harassed uh, by the uh, police, and so forth. So um, this um, um, southern model offers some hope for the solution to the very severe uh, ethnic problems if, it is, if American maybe leadership would encourage Russian leadership to look closer at the successes uh, in the south uh, maybe that would be the way to go to overcome the, this fissured uh, political uh, ethnic landscape. No, that's, that's a really good uh, point. <clears throat> because, I mean, the, uh, as you say, about the south is, a, is actually a much broader region. I mean, people tend to focus in on the North Caucasus uh, republics, but they're only part of the larger uh, southern uh, federal region uh, of Russia. As you said, this is really kind of the melting pot of Russia, where the fusion 
of all of the people's uh, successive ways of migration uh, into the region and, and has always had much more interesting harmony than, uh, than elsewhere. And, and that's actually you know, one of the, the real dilemmas for Russia moving forward is how can you translate that kind of experience, which frankly was much more of the Soviet experience overall, uh, to Moscow. And it's really in Moscow where the tensions are becoming uh, the most acute. Uh, perhaps from the, just the rapid growth of the city over this last uh, decade. I mean, it's, it's really increased its population by about 3 million, including through illegal migration, which has you know, added a lot of, uh, to the pressures there. Uh, and there are also you know, alternate models of uh, trying to deal with the conflict in the North Caucasus. Ingushetia, uh, one of the uh, republics that I know that you know well, has actually um, been uh, undergoing an experiment there uh, with the uh, president, uh, Yunus Spek Yakurov, uh, over the last uh, year or so, where they've really tried to do a different model of conflict resolution, which actually has made some progress. It just doesn't get any spotlight on it at all, either in Russia itself or uh, more broadly, and has really been uh, a much more enlightened approach uh, to dealing uh, with the region that could have prospects and promise for um, uh, the North Caucasus more broadly. But these are very difficult issues given you know, the attention to other things uh, to uh, bring out into the open. So are there some pretty positive things that are happening uh, there? Now, I think the issue that you've said about Libya here is, is, is really important. I mean, for, for many uh, people um, in, in Russia, I mean, one of um, uh, the most seminal events, as uh, you well know, was 1999 and the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia, which was a, a real shock uh, to, uh, to the Russians. And this, um, there's been the spectre of Yugoslavia raised again by Primakov and many others. This is another Yugoslavia of the US and NATO throwing their weight around and you know, doing this over the um, heads of everyone else. But there's something really different about the uh, period now. The US has been very reluctant. I think the Russians have realized to actually take the lead in uh, Libya. This is much more of a larger coalition. Um, even than uh, Yugoslavia uh, was in terms of there's a lot of pressure also from the region, uh, from other Arab states, the Arab League, uh, the UN, uh, you know, more broadly. This isn't just the sort of liberal intervention in um, Europe's uh, backyard uh, that the, that the, um, the situation in uh, Yugoslavia was. And I think that the Russians have been thrown into a real quandary by this because a lot of their other allies have been more supportive of uh, the developments in Libya. Now, clearly, the Chinese are not too thrilled by this prospect either, but they also um, took a similar um, um, stance. And I think what's different again here is the Obama administration's uh, approach has been much more multilateral than really the Bush administration's approach was. The Russians didn't really like it in uh, the last decade when the interventions have seemed to be a US-led intervention. This really isn't the case, and it's thrown them off. Um, the Germans um, are, are key interlocutors with them. It seems, you know, when you look back at the, um, the last uh, time when Russia abstained in the UN uh, Security Council was over Iran and the sanctions. Now, we all know that Russia was not thrilled at all about the prospect of Iran and the sanctions, and there's been a lot of credence uh, being given to the reset, and that this was really the uh, reason that um, Russia uh, pushed forward this. In actual fact, it was uh, more uh, complex than that. Uh, Russia was really swayed by the fact that the Germans were even actually more uh, forthright and uh, even more aggressive about taking sanctions against Iran than the United States was. They were also swayed by uh, the fact that all of their Arab allies um, also wanted uh, action taken against Iran. And also Israel, uh, which Russia has really transformed its relationship with over the last decade, a lot of lobbying um, of Russia to change its uh, position um, on Iran. And so Libya is a similar situation. The world has changed. Uh, the politics uh, of everything have changed, and Russia's trying to figure out how to um, basically adapt its policy. You can't have politics as usual in this new environment, and I think maybe slowly many people in the Russian uh, political sphere are understanding that the US isn't the driving force anymore here. This is the multipolar world that they kept calling for uh, for the last uh, five or six years, and that might mean that they may have to change also uh, some of uh, their policies. So I think we're going to see much more confusing um, political stances uh, from Russia, which may con maybe mirror more of our own confusion uh, in uh, moving forward. But I think it, you know, it's absolutely, as you've pointed out, this is, this is a new world we're all in. And so, as you said at the very beginning, we live in very interesting times. And let's just hope we turn it into a blessing rather than a curse. So anyway, Girard, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.